Welcome back, welcome back. Once again next month, peace talks will be held to try to secure peace in Darfur. Since 2003, an estimated 200,000 people have died in fighting in the Sudanese province. And some two and a half million people have been displaced, forced to become refugees. Many have fled to the neighboring country of Chad, but the dangers have followed them there. The massive refugee camps which have grown up near the border are now regularly raided by the rebels too. The former President of Ireland and the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, was part of a group of eight high-profile women who've just returned from the camps in Chad. She's now head also of a group called Realising Rights, which is trying to address global problems such as the crisis in Darfur. And she joins me now from New York, a pleasure to see you. Welcome, welcome, Mary. Um, let Thank you, me David. Nice to see you again. Bless you. The, uh, what's the one, what's the, is there one verbal snapshot that sums up what you saw in Chad and of Darfur? Yes, I think it's as bad as it gets for the women and their families, and they're not safe now after all the trauma they've endured. They're not secure. They urgently need protection. They need a ceasefire and they need action to secure them today, yesterday, tomorrow. And who, and who do you blame for this most of all? The Sudanese government? I think the governments must take part of the blame, especially in Darfur. One woman described to us how when the village was attacked, it was men on horseback and planes from the sky. She grabbed her twin babies and ran into the bush and ran and ran and then hid them, uh, put them down under a tree and went back to see what had happened. Her husband had been killed, another older child had been killed. She was seized by four Janjaweed and raped. One of them held a gun and then uh, that one also raped her. And they kind of damaged her so much that afterwards she said she couldn't produce milk for her babies for quite a while. These were typical stories. But men on horseback and planes from the sky tells a very clear story of government complicity. Um, in Chad, you have the big refugee camps, and you have now internally displaced citizens of Chad, villagers who've had to flee, partly because of the rebels coming across from Darfur, and partly internal conflict in Chad itself. So it's in danger of spreading, and that's why the EU uh, commitment, as well as the joint UN-AU force, is so important. And the high-level ministerial contact group is discussing that today. Absolutely, this is this is an important day, an important day for Darfur yes. there in New York, and that's one of the reasons why we're very pleased to be talking about it. And in terms of, but in terms of the Sudanese government and so on, and the various forces, um, what's in it for anybody to prolong this horror? I mean, is it is the long-term interest oil or what? Well, certainly both countries do have oil. Um, both countries have very poor populations. But if you look at their assets, they're not really poor countries. So there's bad governance in both countries. That's part of the problem. And uh, there isn't a proper political process that is um, reasonably inclusive. And that's leading to strife in Darfur, the splintering of groups. And the same thing, unfortunately, is happening in eastern Chad and indeed in the Central African Republic. So you have a sub-regional problem area. But now we have momentum and we have political leadership which is focusing on um, a very big peacekeeping joint force of the UN and AU that is to go into Darfur, and that will be discussed today. Peace negotiations which are to start, they're going to be in Libya on the 27th of October. Yeah. And one of the voices the women, one of the things the women asked us was to make sure that women's voices are heard at that table, that the concerns of refugees and IDPs and of the civil um, for population are part of the negotiations, not just these rebel groups with the government of Sudan. And then there is the EU commitment to secure the camps and put military round the camps um, and patrolling um, in the uh, internally displaced close to villages uh, because they're not secure at the moment. Also policing in the camps. And again, the women have asked for the training of women police in the camps. And then there is a reconstruction because many, many villages have been destroyed, burned, including in Chad, 180,000 people have been displaced in the last couple of months. It's a, it's a horror story. And what about we hear those tragic stories about what's been happening to the women and children? Um, 
We don't hear very much about what's been happening to the men in these villages, but I suppose in some cases it's just as bad or worse in the sense that we don't hear about them because they've already been killed. Is that right? Yes, a number of the women we spoke to are widows, but we also spoke to the male chiefs in each camp. The camps are pretty well organized. They have both ma male chiefs and female chiefs, and we met all those groups. For the male chiefs, it's very frustrating because you can't exercise any kind of decision making in a camp context. Um, the men tend to be in charge of the food distribution, I noticed, and the women find that they don't have enough food and they're trying to supplement their income. So they go outside to get firewood for money or to even do humble jobs in the nearest village. And that's when they get raped and attacked. And it's irregular, undisciplined government forces, and it's rebels, some across the border, and some internal conflict. So I'm very glad that there is a strong nexus of political leadership uh, at the European level between Prime Minister Gordon Brown, um, the new President Sarkozy of France, Chancellor Merkel. I think there is a, a recognition that the EU must both support the, uh, uh, the, the, the way in which this UN and AU UNAMID force will be in Darfur itself, but also take a responsibility for a multi-faceted approach in Chad. You can't do one without the other because it won't work. And also the other situation is obviously this, it's exciting the thought that there will be this large, for, large force, but of course it'll take time to, time to get it there. And that's one of the reasons I guess why you say the situation is urgent because a lot more bad things could happen before the force gets there, couldn't it? Absolutely, and that's why we must get a ceasefire. Um, I um, had a meeting the other day here in New York with the um, ambassador of Sudan and emphasized to him what we had seen and heard. And he has said that the government of Sudan has undertaken, and this was made clear to the Pope when the president met him recently in Rome, that they will have a ceasefire once the negotiations start on the 27th of October. You know, that's still a little bit away, but if we can have a cessation of hostilities and some, there are, is a monitoring mechanism which needs to be revived to sort of police that ceasefire. I was um, both um, surprised, as you will imagine, but also honored to be invited to become an elder recently, to join with uh, Nelson Mandela and Grasa Michel, Archbishop Tutu, etc. And I was aware that our visit to Chad links with a visit of the elders which will take place at the end of this month and the first week in, September, in October. And that will include Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, uh, President Jimmy Carter, Grassa Michelle herself, and Lakhtar Brahimi. And so this weekend we will be briefing them on what we saw in Chad and the negotiations for their visit, which will also bring a sort of moral voice um, on behalf of uh, the suffering people, the voiceless, in Darfur and in Chad. So we're really, really trying to keep up the momentum. Mary, a joy to have you with us, as ever. OK, thanks very much, David. Mary okay. Robinson there talking about the issue which is really central in New York today at the UN. We'll take a short break now, then I'll be asking a question which is increasingly heard around the world. Is Fidel Castro still alive?